Stay tuned for this episode because we jump back in time about a century ago to review one of the most interesting NFL teams in early football. Not because of their play on the field, but for the owner, the star players, and why the team was assembled in the first place. The Oorang Indians are our team of the week, and their story's coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And if you've ever been asked the question, what is the smallest community to have ever hosted an NFL team? Well, you have to think about that for a second. And if you guessed LaRue, Ohio, then you are absolutely correct according to the Ohio History Central website. The Oorang Indians franchise played in the 1922 and 1923 seasons and called LaRue their home. Now, if you remember correctly, the NFL started off as the APFA, American Professional Football Association, 1920 and 1921, they were called that. 1922, they started their name as the NFL. So these are, in fact, the first seasons of the league called the NFL in 22 and 23. But the team of the Oorang Indians were made up entirely of Native Americans on the roster and had some very interesting players of note uh, for that era. And before we get into that, let's look into the reason that this odd name of Oorang was chosen and not LaRue. Well, the story starts with a guy by the name of Walter Lingo. And Lingo was one of the most interesting businessmen and promoters of the early 20th century. He took a boyhood love of animals and turned it into a thriving business at the time. He raised dogs and sold them, specializing in the breed of Airedales uh, in hunting applications. In fact, it's said that his Airedales were the best in the world. The people from your average American families, hunters, to the Cuban dictator Fugino Batista, President Warren G. Harding, President of the United States, as well as top athletes Jack Dempsey and Ty Cobb all visited the exceptional canines uh, from Walter Lingo. Now he was became very popular because of these Airedales. He invited people all the time and was uh, with very famous people like we just mentioned uh, from you know all walks of life and entertainment. And they would come to LaRue to see these amazing animals and his and he would promote that and market that so his kennels would be even better. Uh, now Walter used his marketing genius and made up a name of Oorang Kennels as his business. Now, his son, Bob Lingo, some years later, once commented that the Oorang Kennels sold about 15,000 dogs in just one year at their height, and they were big time in the dog world. And you see, Lingo always had deeply admired the hunting prowess of Native Americans and felt that the association with these Native peoples would have the uh, um, Indian Native American sounding name would instantly connect his champion breed of hunting pups uh, with the word hunting. So the word sounds like a Native American word or a tribe name. And that's what is many confuse it with. But in fact, it's not either. It came strictly from the imagination of Mr. Lingo. Oorang. Who knows how he came up with that one. As his kennels were at the height of their popularity, an opportunity arose in a unique way to market his wares even further in a new unexplored territory. Jim Thorpe, the world champion athlete, had hunted with Lingo in LaRue on a couple of occasions, and on one of these expeditions, Walter Lingo, always looking for new ways to publicize his Airedales, hatched his best promotional brainstorm to be connected to football. He found out that the newly formed professional football organization, the NFL, was selling franchises for about 100 bucks, and what a good way to market his dogs in a demographic that was sort of shared uh, between his business of the the hunting dogs and the National Football League. Just some sporting outdoorsmen uh, would, you know, he took the chance that maybe they would be connected on there. 
In his plan, he hatched Jim Thorpe would assemble and coach a football team comprised of Native Americans and call them the Oorang Indians. Now, the team would practice and play a schedule and do all the things football players do, but they'd also have a task that no other gridiron team has had then or since. And they would also very publicly help train and show the dogs. Little LaRue, Ohio, with a population of about 700 people, it had no football field in it. Well, they would become a franchise of the National Football League. This may take the cake as far as marketing in pro football history. Yeah. Pigskin and pooches. Who would ever connect such a promotional idea as that? Well, Walter Lingo did, and he really took it to the nth degree. Jim Thorpe in 1922 was getting a little long in the tooth. And remember, he won the Olympic gold medals all the way back in 1912, a decade earlier, and played football for teams such as the Canton Bulldogs, and played some baseball in professional levels, and even was the president of the league in his first year when they were called the American Professional Football Association two years later to be deemed the NFL. But Thorpe still had the desire to compete, though, especially on the gridiron. Thorpe uses connections and assembled a roster that included players from all walks of native backgrounds. Nick Lassa, who many townspeople labeled long time sleep due to his tendency of sleeping in in the morning. But he was a big guy with plenty of power and athleticism. They also had a talented quarterback named Leon Boutel. Another guy, Joe Little Twig. Big Bear. Ted St. Germain. War Eagle. And a couple of former teammates uh, from Canton of Jim Thorpe's, Pete Kalick and Joe Guyon, also joined the roster of Native Americans. Now, Lingo wanted the team to travel around the country to give awareness of the dog kennels as described on the NFL Football Journal blog. We have a link to that on our, our website on, for this Oorang Indians uh, post. They played just one home contest in Little LaRue, uh, an area at Lincoln Park in Marion, Ohio, uh, which is nearby to LaRue, on October 8, 1922, against the Columbus Panhandles and the fantastic Nesser Brothers. We talked quite a bit about the Nesser Brothers when we had uh, Chris Willis on uh, talking about Joe Carr and uh, the Columbus Panhandles teams. We had a couple different episodes where we talked about them. Now, the locals, uh, they enjoyed the Indians' victory on that day for about $1.25 admission, and Zurang won the game 20-6 to over the visitors from Columbus. Now, unfortunately for the home crowd, Jim Thorpe sat out because he was injured that day, but Joe Guyon showed what he could do as he scored two touchdowns of runs of 10 yards and 55 yards and also picked off a panhandle pass. Now, Eagle Feather who was a newcomer to the team, scored the other touchdown on an eight-yard plunge into the end zone. And there were a couple of other home games against some semi-pro teams, promoted as exhibitions, which really didn't count in the NFL standings at that time. Now, the balance of the Oorang games in their first two years of existence, and only two years of existence, were on the road. In the team's first season, the Indians finished with a record of two wins and six losses. The next season, yeah, it got a little bit worse. The team finished with a 1-10 and record. And the franchise was only around for a short period of time, but they did make some lasting memories. Walter Lingo and the team had may have been the first to provide halftime and pregame entertainment to the crowds. Now Thorpe would put on a drop kicking and punting demonstration at times, while others would parade Airedales from Lingo's kennels around the field so that the folks could see him and great, great bit of advertisement and showmanship uh, to get his product out there by Lingo. There was also a shooting expedition of launch targets and the dogs would go and retrieve them all to the applause of the crowd and they were amazed with these great animals and these great athletes and what they were doing. Well, the pregame and halftime activities of dog promotion evidently took a higher precedence than the on-field product of the Oorang Indians and alas, it all came to an end and the Oorang Indians ceased to exist after the 1923 season. So they didn't have a very long history, didn't have a very uh, successful football history, but they definitely had a very interesting history. Uh, Walter Lingo and his Oorang Indians, uh, Jim Thorpe, Joe Guyon, Pete Kalick, and, and most of the other players that were on there. So very interesting indeed, a great little tidbit in history. And just uh, to show you, you know, some of the uh, opportunities and um, experiments that 
marketers and businessmen were trying to do to try to connect pro football to the common person and the consumers out there in the United States. And this time, trying to sell dogs. So very interesting indeed. We hope you enjoyed just a little bit of history. Uh, we talk about football history each and every day here on pigskindispatch.com. Won't you please join us? Best way to do it, join our email subscriber list. There's a link in the show notes of this podcast, or you can go on pigskindispatch.com and click the email uh, links there to uh, get your name on it. It only takes about two seconds to do. You just put your email name and boom, you'll get every day at 6.30 a.m. You'll get a nice email of what's coming out on Pigskin Dispatch, the Sports History Network, and on the Jersey Dispatch and, of course, all our fine podcasts and uh, blogs that we're putting out there. So, real easy way to do it. Until tomorrow, everybody, have a great, great on your day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. A special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order.